It's eight o'clock. Welcome to Tribe TV. So good to have you with me tonight. Please do share the link. Make sure you're uh, subscribed to this channel. Put on the notifications and do chat away if you can. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, let us know how these teachings and, and worship impact you. That will be just awesome. The busier the program is, the more the algorithms of YouTube. Just share it out so new people can start to hear stuff. Well, I hope you've been enjoying this new series that I've been doing. Tonight we're going to continue. I'm going to be talking in a little while about how we are turning prophecy into culture. How do you do that? How are we shifting from things that God has said and spoken to us about, pivoting and making change so that we can step into all that God has for us in the future at Revive and I hope it can inspire you to wherever you are in the world. So why don't we just have a song while we're watching people kind of gather and get connected and, and then I'm just going to launch into the teaching. Is that okay? All right, let's listen to this and then we'll get into the teaching.
Well, I want to dive straight into the word again today. I am still talking about resetting revive, the changes and the adjustments we're making in our culture. I, I've said repeatedly, this has been such a pit stop time, a pause for renewal and refreshing and adjustment and to hear God again and to make sure we're not experiencing mission drift and for God to give us some new words for the new era ahead. I believe some have even been in a sense of delay, not just for two years, but for longer, waiting for this prophetic moment in God when he's going to push you into something new. So get ready for it. If you've been sensing a hold back from God, well, it might just be the divine catapult getting ready to launch you into the future. On the first week of doing Resetting Revive, I spoke about the fact that one of the big reset changes we want to make is we want to become more of a house of prayer and worship and encounter and prophecy and being in God's presence than ever before. We want to find a home for that, a place for that. We don't just want to start slots. We want to birth a new sense of the presence of God among us. People like Lana Vossa have been prophesying that there'll be places around the world that house wells of glory like never before coming out of this season. That resonated with our leadership team so much. And so, hey, the thing about a well is sometimes you, you've got to go dig it. So we're beginning to dig this well as we pray these 21 days and some of the new things that God's doing beyond. So the first thing, a house of prayer for all nations. That's how Jesus defined his house, his temple. And so we want to make sure we're running after that. And I believe if we get that right, everything else will follow in the way that God wants to. And there'll be the power and the authority to run with God as we should. The second thing, and I spoke about this uh, last week, and then there were more details sent privately to members online, but we're resetting our building strategy. A lot has changed, and I've spoke to the church about that in person at Cottingham, and then privately online. And so we're making adjustments to our building strategy right now. This week, I want to talk about resetting our culture. And by way of introduction, let me just read to you eight major cultural changes that I think are taking place right now. If I think about it, it, it would probably help because this is going to be a short version. But if you've read my book, The Divine Reset, you'll know where I'm coming from in all of these adjustments. I speak about them. I gather prophetic words from around the world and a sense of what God's been saying to me personally and our conversations as leaders in Revive over the last 20 months. This speaks of the cultural reset going on. But I'm going to give you a short list of eight things and let's see if we can begin to look at how we can turn prophecy into a cultural shift in our church life. And then also I'm going to begin to outline some practical things that we're going to do to help this cultural shift to embed and take place. So listen up. Here it is. Eight things. Resetting our culture. OK, here's the first one. We want to shift from doing the normal to doing what works. It is time to innovate. Innovation is a huge word for this current season. Number two, we want to shift from the show, the Sunday morning show, to simple, real family on a mission with God together. Number three, we want to shift from exhausted by the show to effective. We want to stretch out into evangelism and being a true family and into mission more than ever before. Number four, we want to move from fragmented to family. Really difficult with a big commuter church spread across a wide region. Number five, we want to shift from Sunday centric, just one big day when it all happens, to seven days centric like the book of Acts. There's always someone praying, encountering, encouraging, reaching out and on mission. Number six, we want to shift from platform centric to family and mission centric. It's not about how good the guy is on the stage. It's about us living the real deal. Number seven, we want to move from mega church concept to growth through multiplication. Number eight, we want to move from building our church. It subtly happens no matter how hard you try to bringing his kingdom with the rest of the church in an area. 
Now, you might think I'm making out that Revive was awful pre-pandemic. No, 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 I'm probably exaggerating some of the subtle things that get lodged in our culture over time and probably making more of them. So don't worry, it's, it's probably more aimed at making sure I'm absolutely pure and on it myself as a leader and us as a leadership team than necessarily all of the church. But it's more about making sure we're fully pushing into healthy culture for today. So let's think about a few of those things that I've listed. The piece about innovation, making sure that what we're doing is working. It's not the time to copy and paste, to go, well, this church is doing that, that church is doing the other. We have to look like this. No, we have to hear God and see his kingdom come in whatever way he wants us to do. And we must bear fruit in all things. We cannot sit around doing copied projects from other churches that simply aren't being fruitful, but they're using up resource time energy and all of our margin for other things. Okay, so we're being really particular to say, if, if God hands us a blank sheet of paper, which I said the other day, that's exactly what a prophet came through and did to us a month before the first lockdown. God is about to hand you a blank sheet of paper. If God did hand us a blank sheet and said, come on, there are so many ways my church can come. Why do you just follow the cultural pattern of the Western church, whether successful ones or otherwise? Your destiny is as unique as your wiring and your gifting and your longings and your, your, the place where you live, the location, the era in which you live. So we need to hear God for our now um, strategies and words. So let's innovate and do new things. The second one was, huh, well, look, the show is over. Part of that innovation is that really the way the Western church has just been developing the last few decades is that Sundays have just had to become more and more and more polished to get the crowd through the door, to try and attract them in. We'd even call it attractional church. Now, I don't think we should be ugly church, but if you just have to throw hot dogs and donuts and give away cars just to get the crowd in the door, are they really becoming disciples? And I'll be honest about our team, where we're at, we've done things as well as we can and absolutely we don't wanna be a shoddy church, but also it can be exhausting. And I know <laughs> so many churches behind the scenes are burning through their volunteer and staff like crazy, just trying to keep the show on the road. Well, I feel prophetically the show's over. Let's be the real deal. We, we have to make, I think in this unusual time, the kind of calls that a church that, 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 that Christians, when they suddenly become persecuted, need to make. What really matters? There's a phrase goes around uh, church leadership uh, uh, um, teachings, and I think it's really helpful. It says this, how you attract them is what you'll have to do to keep them. So listen, if we attract people to a show, and I think the idea was if we attract them to a church that just looks vibrant and well put together and super polished and worship is almost like a concert and it's lights and smoke and camera and action, then the hope was, I think, we gather a crowd, we get them saved, and then we bring them into true discipleship. But what often happens is that, that most of the crowd just remain in consumerist Christianity and never become fully embedded disciples of Christ. Some churches may be better at it than others, but it's not really worked for us. And so we want to be much more focused on being family, being real, being on a mission and doing life together. I spoke to our team uh, at the beginning of lockdown while we're analysing the church and we were saying, you know, so what's working, what isn't? And, you know, a frequent comment with our core team was, we just don't feel like a band of brothers on a mission anymore, and sisters, of course. We just don't feel close enough in team. We are ragged doing the work of church. But where is that sense of movement and mission that Jesus and the early church had? And so we're out to recapture that. We're calling time on the show. Happy for Sunday church to be simple, raw, family, real. And let's just start enjoying it and growing in God together. And I think if we attract them to family, well, family is why they'll stay. If we attract them to just Jesus himself, not a show, then Jesus is, will be why they 
stay. I always, I'm so aware that the people that are easiest to work with in life are people that are not enamored with my leadership or in love with a, a particular geographical location or style of church. They are so in love with Jesus. They are just under his orders. And so they are with me for the right reasons. Often it's a line like this, God has told me to come and help you. So while he's telling me to do that, I'm gonna come and help you. Convenience or inconvenience, preference or not, I'm under orders. And those are the most powerful people. How's about we truly attract people to Jesus and not our style? It's inevitable that you have a bit of style, but come on, let's think about what we're doing more deeply. Um, we wanna be effective not exhausted. Uh, so many of our team have been really uh, exhausted in the last few years. And so the pit stop pause of the pandemic has actually been a really good rest to fall in love with Jesus and while we're doing what we're doing once again. Um, but you know, in our exhaustion, the margin starts to go, the energy starts to go. Have you felt this? The soft hearted intimacy with God starts to go a little bit. And he, here's, the, here's the kind of the fruit on the tree that doesn't appear. And so you go, well, it's a tree, but it's not being fruitful. It could be a bit of a fig tree. So let's be careful, right? Think of the story of Jesus. I've looked at like three key things. Uh, evangelism is not going as I've wanted it to. And I'm like, something's wrong, something's wrong. The second one is family. The sense of togetherness and unity is not where I want it to be. And the third one, the sense of the love of the presence of Jesus and the power of God through a vibrant prayer call in the church is not where I want it to be. And there's loads of practical reasons, not being hard on anyone. Sometimes it's just a season that you go through and you end up a bit ragged in it. I remember going through one season years ago and I was exhausted at the end of it. I've been doing this this 30 years. I've had plenty of exhausting seasons. And I, I, I remember talking to God one day about it. So, oh God, I'm tired. And uh, I just had this little vision of a really scratched and wrecked old piano. And God said to me, Jared, you are a well gigged soul. You've just been a bit overused lately and you're not enjoying sonship. You know, the most fruitful place to be, the easiest evangelism, the most wonderful um, sense of team, the most powerful sense of his presence is when we get back to grace and love and patience and the beautiful slow pace of the seasons of heaven, the unforced rhythms of grace. We need to get back to that. So God, take us there and let's find space for these super important things. We can end up so busy doing Western church and be missing some of the biggest things. Are we loving and enjoying each other on the journey? Are people getting saved left, right and center? And is there a powerful sense of God's presence and power and prayer right in the core of our culture? Let's get back to what really matters and be undistracted. We've got to deal with our fragmentation. As, uh, as a big commuter church spread a couple of hours drive uh, from tip to tip in our membership. So that, that's why very often we end up, I've put it there, um, Sunday centric because people will drive in only for a Sunday uh, and, and don't tend to come back in the week. So you see people for short slots of time. And of course, faithful, wonderful, devoted followers of Jesus, but the actual time of being church together because it is very limited. So what you end up is with fragmented human relationships and it's very hard to develop team off that. So we're gonna make some practical changes to hopefully adjust that sense of fragmentation in our busy, busy commuter world in our region. We wanna shift from Sunday centric to seven day centric, to have a hub, a home where you can come virtually, I hope eventually, any time, maybe even day or night to pray and hang out. Certainly to pray any time, day or night would be awesome. But times when you can come for food, uh, a place that people really want to be in and be together as a hub for all of our work in the region. So uh, look out for that coming up. Um, we wanna shift from uh, what some have called the mega church model, big halls and big crowds. I think that's last era for me. Others are gonna be called to do it, wonderful, off you go. Me, I feel actually 
that growth can happen better through multiplication, sociologically, psychologically, and theologically, I have always thought much better to have smaller groups where relationships can be deeper than to have one big crowd. The loneliest place to be sometimes is in a massive crowd. It's all right for the extroverts, but the introverts, which is loads of us, can't stand it. I, 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 now, I love to be in a big crowd for, for worship, and I love to hear great preachers preach, but I also know that is celebrating church. It's not church. It's celebrating church. Church, real church, has to be in circles, not rows in a theatre, but in circles, round tables, hanging out, food, being together on this journey, talking about the stuff that we're going through and giving each other grace. So we want to create this world where we shift from one big crowd in one big hall is going to make us happy and be the sign of success and fruit. Two, we're going to begin to adjust the very shape of how we operate. And here's a key word that's come to us while we've been praying about all this and is going to begin to affect the physical structural shape of how we meet. And I'm really praying that it will help our culture. Here's the word, it's the word, it's time to break down the big galleon. And uh, one prophetic guy put it, and I saw it breaking down into multiple small catamarans. Break down the big galleon of revived church into smaller catamarans. And that came through a couple of seasons, seasoned prophetic people uh, quite clearly. And so I didn't like the word when I first heard it. And, and in some ways I, I still don't break down what has been, truly bring a big adjustment to the structure is something I didn't really wanna hear. I didn't like it when Vicky first heard it. Uh, uh, she didn't like it either, but we, we've pondered and prayed as leaders over this word and uh, we have to take note. And so we're looking at quite a different shape for the future that will hopefully help us and facilitate a lot of these cultural shifts that I believe need to come. Another important word uh, that came to us in this time and that's, that has been to do with the shifting of our building strategy is this. Uh, the word was, you're not building a normal church, building. It's going to be a hub, a nest, a training centre. And as you can see, well, I've, I've got a hub of a wheel there with spokes going out. And that's really begun to affect my thinking about where we're going. So let me chat to you for a moment about the practical outworking of all these things. What's the best structural family shape we can put on everything to hopefully uh, empower us to have the cultural shifts that we want so that we can be and see all these different changes come about. I suppose the first thing is to mention is, is I know I quote a lot of prophecy at the moment. I found it personally an incredibly powerful prophetic time the last 20 months. Not always easy, so don't think that I've been in intimate heaven with Jesus all the time. I found it really frustrating too, practically with lockdowns and the pandemic. But it's also been a very powerful prophetic time in dreams. God speaking so clearly to, to bring change. He speaks a lot in pivotal change times. And he's been speaking a lot to me uh, uh, personally, but then a lot through others. I've even prayed at times over major decisions. God, I, I know so many prophets around the world. I need them to be picking up the phone and giving me words now. And just, just recently, within 48 hours of praying that, I have three major prophetic people word from people around the world giving a sense of direction. So it's been intensely prophetic, so I, I cannot ignore it. Um, uh, but with all of these words, as the Bible says, despise not prophecy, uh, test everything, hold on to the good. And what happens is as the word goes from God's mouth and hits our lives, it begins to shape us and form us. So what I'm saying to you might sound all very sudden, but for me, this has happened over 20 months of listening to God about this pivotal turn. And that's why I'm taking these weeks to download it now and even go as far as turning prophecy into cultural and practical adjustments. So please don't think this is done lightly. Somebody has a dream and we change the whole shape of things. No, pondered, discussed, 
prayed, at times agonised and argued over ways through. And then it come to a landing of, okay, well, let, let's strike out in this direction and uh, let's see how we're able to work with God in it. But so let me, let me show you some practical things. Here's our region. Uh, as you can see, people uh, come to revive from right across this region, even further than is on that map. Uh, right now as well. And so we are now talking about having a, a hub, a, a home. Even though we've changed our building strategy um, a, a little bit, we still need to have a home of our own for that seven day uh, seven days centric experience of church, a place for prayer and food and events and, and I, probably one of the locations or campuses somewhere for us to call this is our home happening seven days a week and a, just a lovely place to be together to train people and to grow in God. But then every hub has spokes uh, heading out and here's our three Sunday campuses so you got one over in Ghoul they're doing incredible stuff over in Ghoul I love the work of Steve and Liz Dion and Belinda and all of their team doing incredible outreach work there but here's a big adjustment for those who would normally come to Revive Church in Hull that we are going to shift to break down the galleon to break down what has been one congregation, one large congregation that has begun to be really hard to house in one place without spending a lot of money. We have decided to shift and it's going to affect our culture, our spend, our leadership structure and our shape. And I know it will change people's experience too of Revive, but we are shifting to multiply the one Revive campus in Hull into two. We're going to have two campuses meeting on Sundays that will be as identical as possible. Each will have a campus leader, an event host, a tech team, a revival kids team, but I will shift between the two and I'll minister in one one Sunday and the other the next Sunday. So I'm around in both locations providing that leadership across the two campuses in Hull. But this is probably the biggest shift from all of these uh, uh, cultural things I've been talking about, that we are shifting the one big campus in Hull into two. And we are, for now, at, at least we know we're gonna be keeping the one in the West in Cottingham Civic Hall. And at the moment, we are looking for a venue for the second one in Central or Eastern Hull. So that we're gonna get campuses closer to you okay and you're going to be able to experience revive church closer to your home and uh, it's going to be uh, easier for us to do uh, without uh, having to spend on very big new build locations okay so it's part of the reason why we're doing it like this then you want to add more spokes to that because as well as the sunday campuses we have got outreach locations now those locations that we had going before the pandemic hit and lockdown uh, three of them are still going though they have changed some of them uh, quite a bit and so what's happening is these are uh, clusters of revived members that are very passionate about infiltrating and impacting their community communities with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're super passionate about collaborating with other churches in the area. When we see somebody saved, we don't care whether they come to revive or get embedded in a church right by where they live. So we're, we're about developing great partnerships with local churches and doing an incredible amount of evangelism. In fact, we are gonna give more effort to evangelism and community than ever before in these places. One of the adjustments is that instead of having lots of Sunday services in them like we used to, we're going to begin to have occasional gatherings in these outreach locations. And we're going to meet and do concerts or uh, gather people for a healing night or have a guest speaker so that we can bring people that are kind of seeking God but not yet made the decision uh, to a place where they might make the decision in the context of a meeting because that sometimes helps people. But like I say, we don't care whether people get embedded into revived church or go into a local church. We, we've got partnerships going right now 
out and we hope to increase them even more. So we're going to continue that. See if you remember this old prophetic word that Jean Darnell gave us, that fire from the Humber up through East Yorkshire word where Revive members embedded in communities are reaching them and making a difference. And even now under the pandemic, I still get incredible stories of Revive members infiltrating their communities, gossiping the gospel, praying for people and seeing them healed, seeing people come to Christ, having incredible conversations. This is the real life of church. Sunday services are celebrating church, heading out in little teams and transforming local communities is what it's really about. Hey, and guess what? There's even more outreach locations being thought of, prayed about and planned right now. And I pray that we would just begin to increase this to see the fire of the love on the gospel of Jesus Christ stretch right across our region in partnership with other churches uh, uh, we're one team. I've had great conversations lately with uh, the, the Anglican leaders, Catholic leaders, Methodist leaders. We've been talking about venues and all kinds of things. You know what? It's just been awesome because it really does feel like the church, Big C, is one team. They've been so incredibly kind and so incredibly helpful in helping us reshape for the future. So uh, let's just pray that increases, right? Because we want revival and unity creates an environment where the blessing of God is poured out on us. So we are shifting towards three Sunday campuses, one in Ghoul, two in Hull. We are changing what were locations to become outreach locations to continue impacting their regions for Jesus. And there's gonna be occasional services in those places, but it will be mainly given to infiltrating the community and having fun, coffee mornings, alpha, walks, prayer walks, home groups, prayer times, all kinds of stuff going on uh, that helps us to connect. Go play golf, join the local book club, whatever it is, just get out and infiltrate and gossip the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. So that's our new shape as we shift forward. I hope that means there's more clusters of communities for people to join that feel smaller. I hope that there's Sunday services nearer you than ever before. I hope there's more space in church than than ever. But also, we are praying to find this hub, this um, nest as a house of prayer, a training center, a place to gather seven days a week for food, fun, friendship, and to encounter God deeply and linger. It's really hard to linger in a rented venue when the caretaker's kind of, you know, about to switch the lights off. It's really hard. So listen, Sundays isn't church. It's celebrating church. But soon we'll be able to linger in a house of prayer, a place to encounter God. And if you're free on Tuesday night, you'll come then. If you're free on Wednesday mornings, you might come then. If you're free on Thursday afternoon, it won't matter. There'll always be people meeting God and out for a coffee and a chat and to do life together. That is the future. And of course, I'm not even talking about missions all over the world and all the other stuff we do and missions mobilization. Go check it out on the website. The way that Revive Ministries and Family of Ministries are transforming thousands of lives every week around the world. Ha! <laughs> That's still going on. We're just trying to get the core sorted here as well uh, in how we operate. So just a few more little bits of information and then I'm done. Okay, let me end with one scripture and then three practical announcements that are kind of imminent and relevant today. Listen to this, Philippians 3 and verse 12. And he's talking about the fact that he's running after the desire to know Christ more than anything else. And he says this in verse 12, not that I've obtained all of it yet or, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. God has called you on a journey to forget what is behind 
and to press forward in Christ. And I know potentially with all these things I'm talking about, this is a moment in our journey when we've gone from pausing now to sudden acceleration and change. But let's be up and ready to run with God. Remember that word, the sense of the breeze of heaven coming and God saying, here I come, ready or not. Let's be ready for change lest we bump our heads against the walls of a new day because our feet are still set to yesterday's path. Now, come on, let's align with God for where we're going. Take the journey, let things go and run with God. A couple of practical things. Number one, as part of our journey uh, to find a new venue in Hull, we're heading out on tour from October the 10th On Sunday mornings, the Cottingham service will continue to go on every Sunday, but I want as many as people as can to come and uh, join me uh, and Chris. We're going to be out trialing different venues around Hull. We're going to be praying for the city. We're going to go feel what some venues feel like. We're going to see what it's like in the east, in the centre. Uh, Try try out a few different places. And uh, so we're calling it God of this city and the subtitle there is fire from the humber up through east yorkshire that vision that jean darnell gave us of being a regional church spreading fire the passion and the love of jesus across the region let's go do that okay so we can free up some seats in cottingham so because it's been fully booked every week for weeks now so let's pick up a load of people and head out on tour those of you that pray Come with us. Come on, let's go pray. Those of you that are missional, come and do it. Those that need to stretch the muscles of their of their experiencing God a bit, come and join us as we meet in different venues and we praise, seek God. I'm going to preach. We're going to pray. There'll be worship. And let's get together and try out some new venues and see how it feels. Whilst also the Cottingham service and Revival Kids there will continue. So that tour starts October the 10th. Sunday mornings, probably for four Sunday mornings, we'll announce each venue each week as they're prepared and ready. The second practical thing I'd say is come serve with us. As we're picking ourselves up and heading into the future, we need people to help us do the basic, simple things that we want to keep doing. Welcoming people as they turn up at church, people on worship team, uh, tech team. As you can hear, it's all a lot lighter and a lot easier than it used to be, but we still need teams to run with us. Revival kids, we want to minister to uh, our kids and to equip extraordinary generations ready for an incredible move of God. So look out for that. Come and join uh, a team and let's begin to run together in the things of God again. Get those muscles shifting. Don't end up just lying on the sofa. (laughs) If you can help it, let's get out and serve God together. And then the last one is that tonight, 7.30 at Kingswood House, we are launching 21 days of prayer and if you can, of fasting. It's going to be a service every single evening, 7.30 at Kingswood House for the next 21 days. That is the 26th of September to Saturday, the 16th of October. Uh, There'll be prayer. You don't need to book, just turn up. On Thursdays, the only exceptions are these. On Thursdays, it's for all the worship team only. On Fridays, it's for all youth only. And then the other difference is on Tuesday, the 12th of October, it'll be part of our Spirit and Word Leader Summit. So that night, you're welcome to join us in Willoughby when James a ladder in a prayer storm will be ministering and so that'll be a bigger group getting together in the McCure at Willoughby. Come and join us for that. Let's have 21 remarkable days of pressing into God and all that he has for us in this new day. I'm expecting God to be speaking. I'm expecting prophecy. I'm expecting encounters with God, worship, being in his presence. And we'll go for about an hour each evening and it might linger a bit longer if it's really cooking on gas, but we'll go for an hour in general and we'll just hang out longer. But come, let's seek God together and let's push into a new day in him. Is that okay? See you tonight if you can make it or some other night in the next 21 nights as we seek God together as a church. 
uh, I'm going to end. I, I spoke about the different ministries uh, around the region and around the world doing remarkable things and ministering to thousands of people and bringing transformation. Well, let me remind you of the incredible work of David and Darryl Luce Taylor in Colombia. Pray for them as you watch this video. Consider sponsoring a child and transforming a life or just partnering with the whole ministry so they can use that money on everything from admin to buildings, okay? There's different ways to partner. Uh, so either sponsor a child or just give them money and say, it all ends up blessing the children in some way or other, but just give them something monthly and say, use it however you need to do to transform those 1,500 or so children that they minister to every single week, transforming the nation of Colombia. And then we'll end with a song, and we're done. God bless you. Thanks for being with me today. Jesus bless you. Keep you healthy, safe, and strong. Vistra Mosa is a very poor community indeed. It's a dangerous community. It's a violent community. I think education is pivotal. We feed kids here, we give kids regular meals, but you know, regular meals are not going to change a child's life. Only education and a faith to go with it can really truly make a significant difference in these children's lives. It's a dangerous and difficult country, one of the most dangerous countries in the world. So to have a place like this that really is an oasis, it really does provide a place of safety, nourishment and a place to truly grow and have aspirations in life. Education is very important to me because it's helping me to accomplish my dreams to be a lawyer and I give thanks to the Lord and to Oasis for all their help. It was on, on my way to Vista Hermosa when I saw this piece of land and at that precise moment God spoke to me and he said I want you to buy this piece of land and then he told me what he wanted me to build on the land. Everything that you see on here has been uh, built since God told me to buy this piece of land. 20 years ago the kids would come out of school wanting to be cleaners or to just have some kind of a wage. Now they're coming out wanting to be solicitors, police officers, doctors, teachers. Uh, in other words, they're not just changing the lives of individuals, they are transforming society. When you're doing that for one and a half thousand children every week, it starts to have a real impact. Now they've got an hope that their lives are going to be changed by the education that they receive, by the faith that they're going to develop at the Oasis of Hope Church and by the level of love that it received. We've been blessed by God. You know, God has given us the tools to do a lot with a little. To take peace and hope and love to these kids is what we're all here to do. Whether we're Christian or not a Christian, we're on this planet to love each other and care for each other. And that's what it does. Everything I dreamed of What I was waiting for
You're everything I dream of You're what I was waiting for You're everything I dreamed of You're what I was waiting for You're everything I dreamed of You're what I was waiting for Everything I dream of You're what I was waiting for You're everything I dream of You're what I was waiting for
what is the tribe I hear you ask well it's a global online learning community there are loads of us around the world interacting growing stretching in the things of God together and having fun as we learn there's three tiers in the tribe tier one is basic access to our tribe zone it is an online learning zone we use the same software as Harvard University so it's great it's powerful it's intuitive and it works really well on everything from a tablet to a phone to a laptop and you can grow with us in the things of God over everything from leadership to church growth to faith things of the spirit prophetic the miraculous it's all there 500 modules of audio video e-courses and stuff like that as well as that you get a private facebook group where you can interact with vicky and i and we can be growing in the things of god together tier two is all of that but it's for leaders it's our global leadership tribe and so it has a lot more leadership content as well you get four books the moment that you join sent to you and then you will get every book i write in the period of your membership sent to you free of charge we want to invest in leaders and so it's much more interactive at tier two Tier three is where 10 leaders in one team can join together so you can learn and grow. It is a brilliant resource to give to all of your team. You don't always want to lose them as they head off to Bible school. You want to train them right where they are in a training community, and that's what this is. So if tier three interests you, have a little look at that. Let me show you some testimonials of what people are saying about their life and learning with the tribe. Hey there, it's Roma Waterman here from Melbourne, Australia. I just want to say I'm amazed at the amount of resources that are in tribe and the fresh content that's constantly being added. I say this with complete truthfulness. I think Pastor Jared Cooper is one of the best teachers in leadership and the prophetic and creativity that I have heard in the world. So I highly recommend it. I highly recommend that you sign up and, and be part of such an amazing community. Hi, my name is Dave Mullinder. I'm the pastor of Grace Church Bridlington and we connected with the tribe because we knew a lot of the people and the voices that we heard were encouraging and inspiring. A lot of prophetic voices that helped us and guided us. It helped us to feel like we were part of the global picture and not just our little part of the jigsaw but above all things we learnt two specific things practical and spiritual and the practical things that we have taken principles from the tribe and applied them to our church which means we manage it better we present it better we make it look better and sound better and the practical principles have been brilliant but there is also the spiritual principles of apostolic anointing and as we've listened and applied spiritual principles into our church we've actually seen the church start to grow and we believe that we're about to hit the second wave of growth from connecting uh, to the tribe so we want to say god bless you thanks for doing what you're doing and encourage you to get involved if you can with the tribe hi i love the tribe because it's a place of the prophetic it's a place of fun and with a healthy dose of the practical included as well there's a whole wealth of resources on there that will keep you going for years and on such a range of subjects that you could do bible school in your pajamas if you wanted to and where else could you get an international apostle like jared answering your questions it's just brilliant so if you ever feel a bit like elijah and thinking oh poor old me i'm the only one left who's been zealous for god then you can just log into the tribe community and discover no actually god's reserved a whole remnant of people who are who are there ready and waiting to encourage each other on and do great things for god's kingdom so if that sounds like your cup of tea come over and join us it would be lovely to meet you isn't that incredible head to jaredcooper.net and come on join this family of people growing in the things of god growing in the word growing in the spirit and enjoying this journey of walking in god together you don't have to be alone you don't have to make it up as you go along come and join the tribe and let's enjoy life together